on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. Tonight on Piers Morgan Uncensored, with me, Richard Tice, and Isabel Oakshot, on an extraordinary day of unbelievable bombshells from Prince Harry. The sensational claim, he says he killed 25 Taliban fighters and thought of them just as chess pieces. We'll speak to the former British Army colonel who says his comments are truly a betrayal of the military. Prince William physically attacked him after an argument over Meghan, alleges Harry. We'll speak to Princess Diana's friend and psychic, Sally Morgan, about whether reconciliation can ever be on the cards. And the revelations don't stop there. We'll get all the reaction to Prince Harry admitting to taking cocaine when he was just 17 and also literally begging his father not to marry Camilla, fearing she'd become the wicked stepmother. Live from London, this is Here's Morgan Uncensored with Richard Tice and Isabel Oakshot. Well, good evening. As everybody knows, this show is called Piers Morgan Uncensored for a good reason. Piers is a champion of freedom of speech. He doesn't believe in censoring or cancelling anyone. Indeed, the Piers Morgan show has a special line in uncancelling people. But while the cat's away, the mice will play. So before Piers comes back, Richard and I want to make the case for a single global exception to his policy on cancelling people. In the sorry case of Henry Charles Albert David Mountbatten Windsor, a.k.a. Prince Harry, we think his behaviour has been so appalling that he must, with deep regret and after careful consideration, be both censored and cancelled. Following his latest extraordinary attack on the royal family, accusing Prince William of physically assaulting him to the point that he was left with telltale bruises, and suggesting that he might shun his own father's coronation, surely it is high time to no platform the world's most famous ginger winger to stop listening to his increasingly hysterical, never-ending list of woe-is-me grievances, to stop indulging his bitter vendetta against his brother, our future king, and stop rewarding his woke snivellings with multi-million pound publishing and film contracts, and frankly, absurd interviews. Unbelievable. Harry's allegations against his own family have already caused massive hurt, huge damage to those he claims to love and to his own country, a country he once proudly served and was once willing to put his life on the line for. He fought bravely against fellow servicemen and women in some of the most hostile territory in the world. How come, how is it possible that he's now become such a wimp. He's bleating about stumbling on a dog bowl. His book Spare, which obviously really should have been called Spare Us, and his endless self-pitying interviews only make it harder and harder to achieve what he says he really wants, which is a reconciliation with his brother and his father. His attacks on them and on the Princess of Wales are cowardly because he knows they cannot and will not respond. So perhaps it's, perhaps it's now time for the rest of us, for the rest of the country, to speak out on their behalf. So our proposal from the end of tonight's show, after these exclusive revelations coming up in the next hour, is a clear and compelling case, yes, for Prince Harry to become the first person on Piers Morgan Uncensored to be both censored and cancelled. As of next week, when Piers is back, let's just call him by his first name, Henry, and one of his many, many spare names, David. In a flash, troubled, miserable Prince Harry will become plain old Henry David, able to live the quiet, anonymous life he says he craves for. We hope this is one cancellation Piers might just possibly consider. Well, in the last two hours, it's been revealed that Prince Harry lost his virginity in a field behind a pub to an older woman who treated him like, quote, a young stallion. The other revelations in his book include admitting he killed 25 people during his second tour of Afghanistan. Harry described the human beings as, quote, chess pieces, 
that had been taken off the board. The Duke of Sussex also admitted he took cocaine when he was just 17. He also accused Prince William of physically attacking him in a heated argument over his wife, Meghan. Harry said his brother called Meghan difficult, rude and abrasive. The Princess of Wales isn't spared either. Harry recounts an argument in 2018 where Meghan said Kate had a, quote, baby brain a month after she gave birth to Prince Louis. He also turns a knife on Camilla. The brothers allegedly asked their father not to remarry over fears she would become their wicked stepmother. And in the latest extract of his interviews to be screened in the UK and the US, Harry goes even further. I don't know how staying silent is ever going to make things better. Wouldn't your brother say to you, Harry, how could you do this to me? After everything, after everything we went through, wouldn't that be what he would say? He'd probably say all sorts of different things. If you're invited to the coronation, will you come? There's a lot that can happen between now and then. But, you know, the door is always open. The, the ball is in their court. Do you still believe in the monarchy? Yes. Do you believe you will play a part in its future? I don't know. Now, the quote in this book, where you refer to your brother as your um, beloved brother and arch nemesis. Strong words. What did you mean by that? There has always been this competition between us, weirdly. I think it really plays into always played by the air spare. Wow. Well, joining us are the royal correspondent for Vanity Fair, Katie Nicholl, and the Sun's royal editor, Matt Wilkinson, who I think has been whizzing through an entire copy of the book. Is that right, Matt? This is a Spanish version, yeah, as I understand it. Yeah, I had the enormous it. pleasure of reading the book. Exactly. Oh, well, you don't sound as if it was yeah, a no, pleasure. We... Tell us what you found. No, it was. It's an, it's an incredible book, and I think you've gone through some of the main headlines here today. But it, I don't think I've ever read a royal book of so many revelations. And the most important thing here is there's so many revelations from a member of the royal family. And I think that's what the issue is here. There are, as Katie will tell you, there are many, many royal books. She's written some herself, but there are many, many royal books. But the problem here is that a beloved member of the family, like a treasured brother of William, a son of, of Charles, he's the one that is actually airing all this dirty linen. This is the problem that the royal family are facing because there's all sorts of stories, all sorts of revelations that come out about the royal family. The problem is, is that a senior member of the royal family is actually making these accusations, but also revealing the private lives, the private conversations, um, situations with Kate and William that would normally be behind closed doors or normally that journalists would not be allowed to report on. Or if we tried to report on them, we were told it was too private. But we, as I say, we have a, you know, a brother of, of William and a son of Charles that is actually making these things public. And I think that's the most aggravating element of this. I mean, there is so much to say. We've already learned so many extraordinary things from this book. What is a single story, if you like, that jumps out at you the most, that left you with a jaw dropping? I can certainly tell you what mine, my take on it is, but I'd love to hear from you. Well, the ones I think is about Harry's life. It's about his drug taking and the losing, the, losing his virginity. I mean, yeah. these are things that members of the royal family don't normally talk about. You know, he's talking, uh, talking about his time in the army in Afghanistan, where he was saying that he killed 25 uh, people of the Taliban. But it's this opening up of his personal life about the, the sort of tale about him losing his virginity behind a pub and about his cocaine taking. And his, he's opening up elements about where he was hallucinating and talking to a bin. I mean, these are really deeply, deeply personal stories from, from, you know, from, from Prince Harry. Just unbelievable, Matt. I mean, Katie, where do we begin? How, how shocked are you by these revelations? You, I think after the, um, after the sort of the Netflix documentary, mm. you sort of thought, what else is to come out? I think I said that, didn't I? And now I'm feeling really silly because I, I didn't think that he was going to go anywhere near where he's gone. I mean, I, I completely agree with what Matt's just said. I mean, I, I've done this job now for nearly 17 years. I'm, you know, he's not the first member of the royal family to write a book, but he is certainly the only member of the royal family to have written a book this explosive. I mean, those bombshells just come thick and fast. And I think we've almost become oversaturated by Harry and Meghan and this narrative. There's just so much of it. But actually, mm. if you try and just forget the docuseries, and if you try and put that Oprah interview to a side, and you just come into this book, the idea that a senior member of the royal family would write a book like this, I mean, I would say is unthinkable. You, you really have to stop and think, 
I cannot believe what I'm reading, particularly, by the way, Isabel, the account of him losing his virginity. Unless that's a dodgy Spanish translation, I, I, I mean, am astonished. It is jaw-dropping. There's language in there that I'm not even sure we Let's want not to repeat, repeat no. for a family programme. I mean, look, you, you and I sort of generally have a pretty dim view of talking about Harry and Meghan the whole time, but we both agreed that this show can only be all about Harry and Meghan for tonight only, because it is utterly sensational, isn't it? It, it, it really is. I mean, the Oprah interview was was jaw dropping, but that did focus on a sort of a, 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 a short a yeah. short period. This spans his entire life, and I think for me, having written biographies about him and spanning those early years, it, it is it but is you, fascinating. You raised the question, Katie, about what's believable, mm. and. Is this all believable? I mean, there were serious questions about what Meghan said in the Winfrey interview. So how much of this really is believable? Well, look, or is some of it just exaggerated? Unlike Matt, I've not had the privilege yet of reading the entire book. Um, I mean, one inconsistency that jumped out immediately was Harry saying that after he'd been allegedly shoved to the ground and had this physical fisticuffs with his brother, his first call was to his therapist. Well, my first call would probably be to my other half. But the fact is, the other <laughs> half had said... She wasn't allowed to see a therapist because it wasn't a good look for the royal family. Right. It didn't. It wasn't. But but actually, How does Harry has a therapist on yeah. speed dial. Yeah. And so I'm sure we we will pick over the narrative and there will be discrepancies. And and I suppose we ought to point out the obvious, which is this is one person's side of the story. There are yes. always two sides to the story, but. Unfortunately, we're not going to get to hear the other side of Charles's yeah. narrative or Williams because they're not going to go yeah. there. I mean, I, let's just come back to Matt because he has read the whole thing. Um, I have two quick questions on that. We haven't heard much so far about what Harry has to say about the Queen and any conversations that he had with her. Um, so I wonder if you could tell us a bit about that. And also, can you just elaborate on that bin story you told us about just now? You referred to Harry hallucinating, talking to a bin. I think we need to know more of that. Yeah, we'll, we'll be hopefully putting more in the paper very shortly. But there is, a, there is, there are scenes, or there are scenes that he has written about about taking some drugs while at Eton, and it goes into quite a lot of detail about hallucinating um, with some friends, um, rolling spliffs, um, and talking to a to a, a bin that talks back to him. And it's like opening up a kind of scene as a as a teenager, um, uh, addressing no. the, the, the kind of. <laughs> But and also, you, you speak about the Queen. I mean, he, he... I mean, he's... Just to be fair to Harry, he has always been... Publicly, he's always been very respectful about the Queen, and it is, he's very respectful about the Queen in the book. Um, you'll be seeing later that he, he, he does talk about his trip to say goodbye to the Queen, as in he, he talks about his trip where he went to Balmoral. There's, a, there's an epilogue that I think you, you might be aware of, that he'd written the book uh, over the summer. It had been signed, it had gone, but he's written an epilogue um, talking about when he learned that the Queen had died, the conversations that he had with, with the King, and flying up without Meghan and then saying a personal goodbye to his grandmother. And that's quite touching. Um, I mean, it, it, again, it's a very personal story that he is revealing a, a lot of detail about the moments that he had with the Queen, with, with the Queen at, well, at Balmoral. But you're right, he, he's, he, he's not gone in much detail on revelations about the Queen, because I don't really think that's, that's tasteful, or there might not be any, but there, there, is a, there, there are scenes where he is talking in his epilogue about... about well, being the I, Queen can't, of I can't wait to hear all the detail in the paper tomorrow. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. And, um, Richard, I mean... <laughs> where, where, where do we begin? What was in his mind when he thought that it was right to reveal these extraordinary details? Did he think that in the modern world it's good to reveal details about your drug taking well, I think and your he virginity? Did because he said one of the things that struck me is where he says uh, in one of his televised interviews, and we've seen the clips of them. Um, I don't think anything can be improved by me keeping quiet. I mean, just how stupid is he? I mean, Katie, how thick is Prince Harry? Sorry to ask a question. Well, he didn't question, do terribly well but... in his A-levels. I mean, <coughs> we, we we know that, and he didn't go on to university. Um, he went into Sandhurst, um, but. I, oh, I don't know. I suppose a lot of people will be thinking he is inc incredibly deluded to uh, to have done this. I mean, the idea that he says in in one sentence that the door is open for a potential yeah. return. I'm assuming for a reconciliation that he he believes in the future of the monarchy is so incongruous with what he's doing and the impact of his words and what the impact of those words is having on the monarchy. It's almost like he is 
it's just deluded and lost in his own world. We'll have to talk about what's he trying to achieve with all of this? I think he Apart from his... earning a load of cash. Well, I mean, clearly, the, he's gone for the big bucks. I mean, that is indisputable, and you're not going to get a $35 million book and deal without their spilling the beans. Worth, haven't they? They've they have. certainly <laughs> got their money's <laughs> worth. They, they certainly have. But I think, I think there was a genuine desire for him to tell his own narrative, to tell... I mean, I, I was told and have been his told truth. many Don't years... His truth. His truth, his yeah. and Megan's truth. But I do think he has felt unheard for a very long time. And just, just to play devil's advocate just slightly here, uh, that idea of being the spare is something he has struggled with for a long time. I have met Harry on many occasions. He said to me before in the past, you know, I just... I want a normal life. I want to get on the tube. I want to go and be able to buy a coffee. I want to be able to do this. He wanted everything but, but, that he didn't have that wasn't within his birthright. And I'm afraid he has wanted all of the privileges of being royal and none of the responsibilities. Yeah. And the underlying sentiment in all of this, I do not see him take responsibility for anything. Th this is it. I mean, he literally wants to have his cake and eat it at yes. all times. Yes, including Just... wanting to be in the royal family and out of the royal family, making money whilst representing the Queen, it wasn't going to work. He's yeah. tried to create this third way. Yeah. I, I don't believe it has worked. Katie, you're going to stick around. Thank you very much indeed for that. Well, next tonight, Prince Harry says he didn't think of 25 Taliban fighters as people, but instead just chess pieces that he's taken off the board. We'll talk to military and security experts about whether his comments have actually increased the security threats to him and the whole of the royal family.
ahead tonight, what would Princess Diana make of Harry's bombshell allegations about William attacking him? We're going to ask Princess Diana's friend and psychic Sally Morgan shortly. But next, uh, Prince Harry has had a decorated career in the British military, <laughs> determined to serve in not one but two tours of Afghanistan against the advice of the UK government, the security services. He helped to save countless lives as an Apache helicopter pilot. But after admitting he killed 25 Taliban fighters during the heat of the battle, he described them not as people, but as just chess pieces being taken off the board. Does this in some way leave a black mark on his time in the armed forces? Well, I'm delighted joining us is the former commander of the British forces in Afghanistan, Colonel Richard Kemp, and the former head of Royal Protection, Di Davis, and Katie is still with us in the studio. Uh, very good evening to you both. Um, Richard, uh, if we can go to you first, please. These revelations in this book about his, his time in Afghanistan and sort of treating uh, Taliban fighters that he killed as just sort of uh, chess pieces on the board that he just sort of swatted away, is that the sort of terminology that, uh, that, that, that soldiers, members of the armed forces... Uh, used generally, or are you surprised by that? No, it, it's not the kind of way that British soldiers are taught to view their enemy. Uh, he says that he was trained to think of the enemy as something other than human. In, in kind of woke terminology, he says that they, we, we were taught to other them, um, which, of course, is not the case. And if, if we were, if, if, if the British Army in Afghanistan or anywhere else was taught to treat their enemy as something other than human beings, then that would be against the Geneva Convention because they have to be respected at all times. Obviously, when you're killing them, you're not respecting them that much. But if you capture them, if, you, if they're wounded, if you actually kill them and the corpse is there, all of them, the procedures are laid down, they have to be treated properly. Uh, and if you were to train your soldiers to regard these th people as just chess pieces, then how would you then at the same time tell them they've got to look after them, they've got to give them medical treatment, they've got to feed them when they're prisoners, they've got to give proper burial to them. Well, it's nonsense. It sells books, I have no doubt. But oh, it's so, not that, the oh, so, so, Richard, is that the key thing? I mean, obviously, you know, um, members of the armed forces are subject to uh, serious... Uh, the, the rules of the battlefield, the laws, the legality of it. Is he really just using this terminology actually just to increase the value in the sales of the book, in your opinion? I'm sure he is, because because that what he's described is certainly nothing like reality. And he's he's not a fool. He was trained. He was a you know an important member of the team, as you rightly said. He was a Apache pilot who saved many soldiers' lives. If you're if you're a fool, you can't do that sort of thing. And so he knew exactly what was going on. He knew this wasn't the case. But it's a kind of Hollywood type thing, isn't it? To, to say uh, you just treat them as chess pieces. It it's got no resemblance to reality. The so to be, so to be is, clear, Richard, you've, ne you've never heard anyone that, you, that you've served with use that terminology? No, quite the opposite. I mean, the, uh, obviously, you don't, you, don't, you don't love your enemy. I mean, maybe if you're a, a, you know, a proper Christian, I'm not a very good Christian, but perhaps you do love your enemy. But, but no, of course, of course you, you don't just see them as being subhumans. And, you know, that was the, the way the Nazis dealt with their enemies. But we certainly didn't do that. And, and I don't think any, you know, maybe the odd exception, but I don't think there's very many British soldiers who would see their enemy in that light. And if they did, they would be disciplined for doing so. They, they have to treat them well. You have, you have examples of, um, of, of British soldiers waking up badly wounded in a field hospital in Afghanistan. Next to them is an Afghan fighter, an Afghan insurgent, who is also being treated in the same place because you treat them humanely. And, th and that's the reality. The problem with this, with his approach, is that he gives, he's giving ammunition now to people who are tr desperate to get British soldiers well, into court. Well, indeed, and, and I, want, I do want to talk to uh, Di Davies about this. Um, what uh, implications would you say, Di, that uh, Prince Harry's uh, approach on this, uh, in, in the way that he's phrased it, talking about the Taliban as mere chess pieces on a board, what implications does that have for his own security? Has he made himself something of a target? Well, I'm appalled in the same way as the learned colonel <coughs> is appalled. I'm appalled from a protection point of view. You're quite rightly raised the issue now that he 
arguably has raised his own profile and that of his family and his wife and also his children. I mean, they live in the United States where I've worked with the FBI and the Secret Service there. There are such a large number, far larger number of people in the United States who now could see this as a potential target, even more than before. And again, in this country, should he ever come back, there are large numbers of those who still support ISIS and others. So, yes, he's done himself no favours. I have to say the word prat comes to mind. That's a police term for what we call idiots. But Di, I think it... he's a complete and utter prat. And, and Di, what's extraordinary, of course, is that he's been actually complaining about the lack of security when he's been coming over to the UK. And now what, what you're saying, and I think it sort of speaks for the obvious, is that essentially he's upped the risk. He's increased his own uh, vulnerability. Well, there are, and there are people in prison uh, in this country who posed a threat to him. Luckily, the security services and others caught them in time. But you know, you only need one idiot to hear a voice from so-called Allah to go, or any religious uh, feature, and actually go and say, go and do your duty. And that's all it needs. And, and yes, but you know, when they came to this country, they were provided, despite all this nonsense, they were provided because they were with the royal family. They chose to uh, reject the issue uh, of, of, uh, by going to America. And equally, uh, you will see that when they came to Los Angeles, they're going arguably, and I've worked in Los Angeles, to one of the most dangerous cities in the world where firearms are everywhere. So, no, he has raised his own profile by his actions. And, you know, he had security from the day he was born to the day he decided to go from Canada all the way to L.A., he knows security, he knows yeah. the risks, he yeah. knows the threats, and, of course, there's a, a court action going at the moment. Well, thank you for that. Let's just uh, quickly bring back uh, Colonel Richard Kemp. Um, is there any way that Harry is suffering from some form of PTSD? I mean, does this somewhat what explain his extraordinary behaviour? Clearly, uh, it's a big thing to kill anybody, never mind 25 uh, insurgents, 25 hostiles. Perhaps that's affected him much more profoundly uh, than he's acknowledging. Anything's possible, I suppose. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm not a psychologist. And um, <laughs> despite Dai's very generous characterization of me as being a learned colonel, which is something I've never been accused of before, um, mm -hmm. I, d I, don't, I just can't see into his mind. It's, well, everything I can see, there's so many contradictions in this particular part of his book. Uh, for example, he says, I would, you know, I, I was desperate to go home and, and, and with a clear conscience so that I hadn't killed civilians, innocent civilians, as if that's some kind of great virtue. Of course, yeah. it's not a virtue. It's, it, every single soldier feels the same. I know I've spoken to soldiers who have accidentally killed civilians and who regret it for the rest of their lives. Absolutely. So, no, I, don't, I don't know his mind. Um, Colonel Sorry. Richard Kemp, Di Davis, thank you so much for that insight into what appears to be a significant, dramatic increase in the security risk, not only for him and his own family, but actually potentially for the broader royal family here in the UK. Yeah, which is perhaps something he hadn't even thought about. Um, and it seems very naive, doesn't it? I, I actually take a bit of a different view to Colonel Kemp on the way he characterised it as, as pieces on a chessboard. Um, that might not be the full army training, but in, in the reality... I think very much, you know, forget the formalities, the official lingo of it. Of course, in the, uh, in the, in, in the heat of war, in, in theatre, you know, you are facing a threat to your life every day. Of course, you're going to think of them as other. And I wonder if we're going to hear stories from people he served with as to whether actually he really did kill 25. You know, others who've, uh, who, who've served alongside him, because that will be another thing about whether or not actually... He's telling the truth here. I mean, I, I suspect that those he served with will actually have more honour than to do that. You know, there is, it's so unusual to speak out in the yeah. way that he has. And I just think that members of the armed forces, they take great pride in kind of protecting each other and just not breaching the kind of protocols in that way. And, and sort of, you know, behaving as one would expect of, of members of the armed forces, you say.
behaving with. Uh, any thoughts on that, Katie? Just <clears throat> Well, I interviewed several people that Harry served with for my biography on Harry, and um, actually they all said that he was a brilliant soldier, yeah. that yeah. he was one of them. And mm -hmm. I, I think, Isabel, you're right. I, I think they would, they would never dream of turning on Harry, I but think I think is. they'd also be quite shocked. The idea that he has given a number to the number of people, I don't really think it's the dumb thing it's in the military. Really isn't. You know, I just having, don't think it is. I spent a year and a half researching the armed forces, talking to all sorts of people at every level, and I never heard them talk quite like that. Mm. And you wonder why he's done that. Was he persuaded by publishers? Is it to make him look like the hero prince to America? Yeah, well, yeah the, the, the hero soldier. Who knows? Well, coming up next, Princess Diana's friend and psychic, Sally Morgan, reveals the conversation that she had with Prince Harry that's ended up in this bombshell new book, Spare. She joins us live shortly. is Talk TV. Still ahead tonight, is she really the wicked stepmother? We'll discuss Prince Harry's claims that he and William begged their father not to marry Camilla. Talking about that shortly. Among the sensational claims in Prince Harry's new book are allegations that Prince William physically attacked him. Harry says, he grabbed me by the collar, ripping my necklace, and he knocked me to the floor. I landed up on the dog bowl, which cracked under my back, the pieces cutting into me. I lay there for a moment, dazed, then got to my feet and told him, get out. 
Also in the book, he details a conversation he had with his mother's friend and psychic, Sally Morgan, where he asked about his mother's death. He wrote in the book that she told him, quote, you're living the life she couldn't. You're living the life she wanted for you. Well, Sally Morgan joins us now. Katie is still here. And also we've got psychologist Honey Lancaster James down the line. Um, Sally. Hello. Wow. Great to have you with us. Um, what are your thoughts? Dear Harry. Oh, where do we start? Yeah, I mean, well, it's, to me, he is dear Harry. I know that, you know, he's taking an awful lot of stick at the moment, but it's his way of grieving, I think, as well. I think okay. that he's grieved. I, I, you've got to remember, I know him or yes. spoke to him because of his grief. Yes. And, uh, yeah, that's. I think that it's it, all of this, all of it his behaviour. It all traces back to. to his, his, he, he, the, it all traces back to how they were not allowed, and I'm including William here. Yes. They were not allowed to grieve in the way that they wanted to for their mother. So I was fascinated to learn that Harry contacted you, and he appeared in the conversation he had with you to be troubled about whether or not his mother's death was really an accident. Is that correct? Well, that was the first thing he said to me. What did he say? Uh, the first thing was, hello, how are you? Um, and remembering a, a time yeah. that we'd, we'd been to, and we'd then? met. And then he said, I really need to know, what do you think about my mother's death? And I just said to him, I was a bit shocked. Um, and I thought, well, it's not my place yes. to give him my thoughts. Yeah. He's asking me as a medium, yes. as a psychic. And I said, you need to speak to your aunt, Sarah, Sarah McCorkindale. So not that's, the other that was Lady Diana's sister. sister. That's right. Now, I thought that was incredibly interesting because this is new to me. So you advise Prince Harry to speak to Princess Diana's sister about what really happened. Yeah, because I thought accident. he shouldn't. He needs to get he needs to get the information from her. She was the one that said to me four days after the funeral when she rang me at home because I used to see her on a regular basis at least three times a week. Right. She was um, most of the time the Princess of Wales lady in waiting. She would yes. go on and so yes. she would travel down from Norfolk. I lived just off the A3 at the time. Yes. She would pop into okay. me, then pop into me on the way back to Norfolk. Right. So, and I, she rang me. We were very four days close. after the funeral, funeral she and I was really me. shocked because the first yes. thing I said to him when I picked up the phone, yeah. um, what, what are you doing ringing me? You know, your grief, you're grieving. Yeah. And she said, oh, Sally, I just there's a few things I just wanted to say to you, and she wanted to talk about a tape that because every single reading is taped. Right. They took the tapes. Yes, um, and. There was a tape that she was really interested in that they had listened to on the train yes. on the way to Autrop. Yes. And so she was spoke about that. And then she said to me, what do you think happened? And I said, well, it was an accident, wasn't it? Just So just to be clear, then, Princess Diana's own sister, four days after the funeral, was questioning whether or not Princess Diana's death was truly an accident. Is well, that that's correct? well, that's how you see. I'm telling you what she said to me. We can make of it. I'm not saying you're not right, but when she said to me, "Will you always? Will you promise me that you will always say her death was an accident?" and I went, "Well, it it was, wasn't it?" And she, it, you know, why would she say that to me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Honey. Uh, Honey, good evening. Thanks for joining us. So you've heard these extraordinary revelations, these bombshell claims uh, from Prince Harry in this book. I mean, what are your thoughts about the state of mind of Prince Harry? How, how difficult will it be for him to, to try and seek some form of reconciliation that he talks about, given what he's done? Well, the truth is, I mean, I, I wouldn't like to comment on what his state of mind is at the moment. He's not my client. If he was my client, I have to say I wouldn't be giving any interviews at all. I'd of be course. keeping that confidential. Mm. Um, but uh, uh, what I can say, I mean, certainly the revelations of what has been printed in this new book have been coming thick and fast today. I mean, my phone has been off the hook. Everybody is talking about some of these 
allegations, some of the things that have been published. And so I think if we sort of reflect on those claims, um, I mean, it's my specialist area to support public figures. That's the area that I generally work in. Uh, my company, Onset Welfare, we work with production companies around the world. We specialise in supporting people who live their lives or work in the public eye. And what I see uh, from people that we've worked with over the years when they do a tell-all book, when they go live to the world with some big revelation, is often an individual. I mean, we work very much with the real-life person. We try to get things from the horse's mouth. And what I often see is that there's usually been a very long time before this big moment, this big crescendo where it all comes out, where this person has privately struggled to hold a lid on perhaps some things that they desperately wanted to talk about, that advisors have said they shouldn't, or people have said to them that, um, yeah, but, you know, you should but, keep this all behind closed honey, doors. So that's the only thing I can think, really. He will have known the impact of these revelations. Um, how will he be feeling now? It's going to be all over the world's newspapers for days and weeks. I mean, how will they as a couple, how will they cope with this? What will be the impact on them? Well, one thing I'd, I'd like to think is that they have support. And one thing that um, Harry and Meghan have been public about is that they do have mental health support. I think Harry has talked about that in his book as well, how he has a therapist or therapists, uh, some people providing them with support. And I really hope that that is robust well, and there is, confidential. There is, a, there is and a weird discrepancy, though, isn't there, honey? Uh, in, the, in the book, he talks about this extraordinary showdown with William in which became physical uh, William allegedly knocked him to the ground and the, the first person uh, Harry says he called was his therapist at the same time as having previously mm. suggested uh, that Meghan wasn't able to get a therapist because that wasn't the done thing in the royal family. How are we to reconcile these two conflicting narratives from him? Well, again, from my understanding about Meghan's comments about that was that at a particular time she wanted to go somewhere and get help. She says that she wasn't uh, permitted to do that. I think that is different. Um, but what I think Harry's done there is actually something that in some sense, psychologically, was probably a sensible thing to do if that's what he did. Because at a time when your emotions are running high, it actually can be much more helpful to turn to a professional for support than to your close family member because they are involved and they mm, will have yeah. feelings about it as well and they'll be sort of too close to the issue so in that sense I would say anyone else out there anyone watching actually who has been through major sources of conflict in their own family lives as, let's face it this is a very common thing as, as I would you, say it is helpful as to you say honey to he is going to need and Megan are going to need a lot of support uh, thank you so much honey indeed Sally Final thoughts, I mean, just on this extraordinary well, I, day. Um, it, um, completely extraordinary. I don't think there, there'll ever be a reconciliation with the brothers. Mm. I just, it's never going to happen. I mean, and, I get... and, I, and I think that it's so sad because one of the things that he it's... said to me when I had that conversation, uh, we, we spoke for a long, long time, he wanted to know how his brother, he said, my bruv, how will my bruv be, mm. knowing that William was, you know... The, the, the heir to the throne. This is the tragedy of it, isn't uh, it? And it's that he's, that he's he... per probably permanently destroyed the closest relationship oh, completely. That, that the pair of them had. Yeah. And Why I think any, any, any form of reconciliation will be literally for the public eye, for just how it looks. I don't think yeah. it's going to have any depth to it. I mean, I very much respect what Honey had to say there, but I can't help feeling that too much therapy has been part of the problem here. You know, this is a young man who's been encouraged to share his feelings, to explore them all, and actually hasn't known the limits of keeping that within the confines of the consultation. Yeah, room. I mean, just some of this stuff, frankly, I don't think mm. most of us want to hear. There's just so much... I don't want to know about him losing his virginity. All, all this I sort mean, of very personal detail. stardust off everything. Is there any prospect that actually... That'll, that'll in some way endear him to people. Yeah, no, I don't want to think... No one wants to think of him as being used like a stallion. Are we being a bit old? I mean... Oh, you speak for yourself. <laughs> Thank you. You're a bit old. Dear, oh, dear. Dear, oh, dear. <laughs> Next tonight...
Prince Harry says he's yet to decide whether he will attend his father's coronation. But after, after today's revelations, should he even be invited? We'll discuss that next. Buckingham Palace has kept a dignified silence today, saying nothing about the onslaught of accusations from Prince Harry. But for the royal family, actions usually speak louder than words. So could Meghan and Harry actually be banned from King Charles's coronation? Well, here to discuss this with us tonight is Talk TV contributor Paula Ron Adriend, broadcaster and former MEP Alex Phillips, and Katie is still with us. Paula, to you first. Good evening. Good evening. So what do they do? Do they never complain, never explain, or will they have to uh, say recollections may vary? Well, there's, there's two things here. <clears throat> they do say, they definitely do explain, and they definitely do complain. What they don't do is attribute it specifically to them. It will be a royal source or a source close to the family or a source close to X, Y or Z. Yes. And we know that that happens um, and we will see that onslaught, that tsunami of them not explaining, but actually really they are mm. over the next couple of weeks. I mean, isn't that exactly what Harry has been complaining about? He yes. alleges that this is what they made a habit of, yes. that this that they repeatedly briefed against him and his wife. I Personally, I find that quite hard to believe, particularly in the case of William. Uh, I'd really like to hear what Katie thinks about that, because I just don't really see 
with William what he had to gain from doing that. Kate, yeah, well, well, there you wasn't anything to gain, and as far as I was concerned, mm. I, I never had a courtier briefing against the couple. Right. Yeah, of course they brief. That's their job. They're a communication team. Not against, team, not but against, not, not against each it, other. It not was a, against. It was a deal between them. I mean, uh, so Alex, what? How do they respond? Do they respond? Or do they maintain the moral high ground? I don't think... I mean, he's just blown himself up, hasn't, hasn't he? What is there to say? If, if they were going to say anything at all, and I don't think they should, they should probably say, are you OK? Yeah. You know, do you need help? Because what he has done is very destructive to them, but it strikes me it's incredibly self-destructive. Yeah. And I wonder where his support network is. Oh, you know, I, who's I, saying, I don't really are you want sure to hear about to do I don't this? Hear about his support network. I think he's had too much of a support network. There's all this psycho babble that's got him into the mess in but the first place. There, Katie, it seems to me they're exploiting a very troubled man. Well, there is that. Yeah. There is that. Um, Katie, how do you think Prince William? Uh, personally responds to this. He is so dignified. You know, this is a, a, a guy who's never put a foot wrong. He is at the, his face is poker face all the time, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, he's, he, I mean, it is. You're right, it is. Um, but I've seen a sort of a trend for William, to, I think, to start speaking out a bit more. So he right. addressed those racism allegations. I mean, he was yes. doorstep. There was you know, one yeah. sentence, wasn't yeah, but, it? But, but, it was, racist, but it was a really important it sentence. He was clearly so angry yeah. that he felt the need to respond. Yeah. On the back of that quite tricky tour to the Caribbean, where they came in for a lot of flack he, in Kate, he mm. wanted to address that. He was wanted that to discuss planned, it head on. Do you think, no. Or did he just No, no, it wasn't it? planned. It wasn't right. signed off by, by Charles or anyone else. It was something he wanted to do. So I think while there is still a generation at the palace that believe the never complain, never explain mantra is the best. I think the Prince of Wales is is actually perhaps um, more inclined to, to answer back, and I wonder if he might. I think if we're going to get a comment at all, mm. I but, think but it's likely... Do you agree with Paula the there'll be lots of sort of behind-the-scenes briefings from I can Williams tell you, we've not, had, we've not had briefings today. There's, there, there, there has been a no comment. They are not going... They, they know that if there are briefings, that they, they will only fuel this narrative. But where, um, where does this stop? I mean, we raised the question of could he, could they be banned from the coronation? I don't think they'll be. I personally, I don't think. It was interesting to hear Sally predict that they won't be there. So, so, Sally, but I don't think they'll be banned. Sally's strong view was that they won't turn up. Certainly, I'm sure they'd rather uh, be seen to take the initiative here rather than be, you know, the humiliation of well, being Well, it might, be, it they, might they well be that that's the case. But I don't believe that they would be banned. I spoke to a source, you know, close to Charles, who says he wants to extend this olive branch. He wants yeah. the relationship so, with his son. So he's yeah. not going to so ban Alex, him from the if they are invited, well, they should they attend? Well, it, it, all of this is more publicity for them, which is what they want. But the problem is their publicity takes away the publicity for the royal family. It damages the royal brand. And this isn't about the Kardashians. This isn't a reality TV show. This is a constitutional monarchy. This is how our country works and is governed. And so I think the royal family have no choice but to extend an invitation. But, you know be it at their own peril, because it will be all about those two. Yeah, and it may be that the, this the sort of mutual understanding is that whilst the invitation is extended, it's a formality but and it will be declined. You might have a different view on that. Paul. Absolutely not. They need to be there. They should be there. Really? If they are not invited, let's think about this. You're such a if softie, they're, Paula, If they're not really? invited... No, I'm not a softie. I'm a realist. And mm. actually, I'm dealing with the hard decisions that people have to take. If they don't turn up, what are we saying? What is this family saying? But that's a different point, isn't it? Is, if they're invited, and let's assume they're invited, mm. should they attend? Absolutely. Absolutely. And will they? <sighs> will they? That's another matter. Should they attend? Absolutely. Why? Because Harry says, I want my family back. Well, then let's start getting this family doesn't, back together. Doesn't that just ruin the day for everybody else, frankly? But this isn't about everybody else, though, is it? But what about, what about Camilla, the evil stepmother? I mean, really? How's she going to feel? But who's surprised at, at that depiction? No, Who honestly, I, surprised I, 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 I will just, just, make, a just make a point. Just saying back to what Paul is saying and, and whether they should be there. I, I think we should remember that they were at the Platinum Jubilee celebrations and they were there in a very unsussexy way and that they didn't upstage the royals. I mean, they yeah. really played by the yeah. rule book. That, they were there, but they were not there at everything. long before all of this came out. <laughs> it, 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 it was, although Oprah had happened. I so. mean, I do think on this evil stepmother thing, just to put that in context, he was only saying, you know, we want 
wondered if she would become this caricature. He's not saying mm. she was. I'd like to know what he says about her and the relationship didn't now. Didn't he say things like, you know, he, that she was briefing against, the, the, you know, them and briefing to the press herself and wanted the crown? And I mean, he has just yeah. taken, a, you know, one of those fire blazer guns and gone after everybody. I mean, I have to say, amidst all of this, spare a thought for poor Keir Starmer, the leader of the opposition. <laughs> but today was his big moment, wasn't it? He was going to do his big state of the nation speech, his reset following on from Rishi Sunak's speech yesterday. Can anyone remember anything that Keir said today? I think he actually said anything guys. anyway, though, did he? Let's be Were fair. Just a load of vacuous, He's taking you know. back control. Is he? he yeah, is. I've heard He's that before. Back so far, it hasn't worked out too well, has it? Well, I, mean, honestly, <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder if the king's saying the same thing to <laughs> right. I, hope, yeah. I hope he does. But That's I mean, one person who does need to take back control. But isn't that really the point? I mean, Starmer's never really said anything of, of any sort of note or interest. He's never taken a real position. So maybe actually, maybe this has helped him, bless him. <laughs> I wonder, because it's The Guardian, isn't it, that leaked this in the first place, the Harry revelations. Perhaps Keir Starmer wasn't being left-wing enough for them, so they were just like... Shh. I mean, what's a bit weird is The Guardian, and it was sensational that they got hold of this before everyone else, but why didn't they actually run it in the paper? Does anybody have any inside info on that one? I mean, a weird decision. You've got a massive global scoop and you just put it online. A bit strange. And for it to be leaked however it was to a British paper, I mean, we know how much Meghan and Harry hate the British press. So it was whether it was a, a calculated leak or, or not, I, I suppose that will emerge. Oh, well, Bless it's the Guardian. Maybe, uh, maybe they just didn't know how to handle it. You know, well, it's the Guardian <laughs> after all. That is also true. Uh, one way or another, I guess it works out for them. If, they're, if their aim is maximum firestorm, I think it, it kind of works. Mission mm. accomplished. What a day. But I mean, this is just the beginning when we actually see the book. It's Megan's book as well, isn't there? Yeah. Oh, please, no. <laughs> And what's the time frame for Meghan's book? We, we don't know yet. I mean, she's been threatening to do an autobiography for, for a while now, so... Right. Yeah. Probably testing the water with Harry's and seeing where they go next. Oh, Goodness gosh. me. And don't I forget, mean... this is a two-book deal for Harry as well, so oh, there will no. be more time. Hang on, so, so that's three in total, and then she might have a two-book deal. Do you think they've, they've, you know, killed themselves off now? Do you think they've completely trashed their own brand, or do you think there are no, people no, like there? No, 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 absolutely not. Absolutely. Plenty of appetite for it, I think. Well, listen, thank you very much, thank Paula. You very thank, much. Alex, thank you. Katie, thank you very much. That's it from me and Richard, wherever you are, up to whatever you're up to, make sure it's uncensored. Good night. Good night. <laughs>